And I'd like to introduce uh, Emeritus Professor Malcolm Hart from Plymouth University. Um, Malcolm has got a wide variety of interest in Southwest geology, ranging from foraminifera uh, as climate and pollution indicators, uh, climate change, sea level change, and also today, Jurassic geology and creatures. Um, he's going to give a talk about Jurassic calamari, which sounds a bit like a name for a, a fish and chip shop, um, which uh, uh, also sells squid as well as uh, fish. So let, over to you then, Malcolm. What I what I put together this morning is something which is sort of almost at the edge of my field of interest, but over the last 10 years since I first began working with a biologist at the Marine Biological Labs in Plymouth, uh, Malcolm Clark. Um, he and I did a lot of work, bef sadly, before he died, um, on these fossil squid. Now, they're not really squid. They're, they're a sort of Jurassic version of uh, the modern squid. but it gives me a chance to show you some really spectacular fossils. Um, and you have to realize that that animal you're looking at there, um, I don't want to bandy around dates, but it's 160 million years old. And yet we can see its body in some of the specimens, you'll see the typical octopus-like ink sac that it used to spray onto uh, predators. And there you can see the arms of the beast um, with a line of hooks along the side of each arm. So these are really quite fascinating specimens. Um, and of course, I'm talking about the Jurassic Coast. Uh, or to give it its full name, the Dorset and East Devon World Heritage Site. And of course, one of the uh, key definitions of a World Heritage Site, uh, as you know, in North Devon with the uh, UNESCO biosphere, is that it must have outstanding universal value. Now, the definition of outstanding universal value is quite complex, really. And in one of the articles of UNESCO, it states to be an outstanding example representing major stages in Earth's history, including the record of life. And then goes on about geological processes and landforms. The other criterion that is often used in defining areas, and this is certainly the case on the Jurassic coast of uh, Dorset and East Devon, is that it's been a center for geological research um, with discoveries that have changed the science. In other words, they've been significant. And one of the features of the Dorset and Devon coast is that there is still a constant supply of new discoveries, uh, particularly the fossils. So what I'm going to do is, and I, I've highlighted those in, in red, is to pick up on the record of life and pick up on the new fossils that are being found during uh, geological research on the coast. So, <clears throat> when you think of fossil squid, um, and here's a, a suggested living example, um, although we really don't know what they look like, um, they're soft-bodied. If you've seen a, a, a dead cuttlefish or something washed up on the beach, you look at it and think, what on earth could you preserve? Well, you actually can preserve the lens of the eye, which is rather strange. You can preserve the uh, 
area that would be normally, when you see a modern cuttlefish, uh, you know the cuttlefish bone. So within fossil squid, there, there is a structure, not quite like the cuttlefish bone, but analogous to it. The other thing, as you saw in that beautiful specimen at the beginning, is that you can preserve arm hooks. And so we do have one or two bits and pieces that give us a chance to reconstruct what these animals were like and what they were doing. So obviously um, everyone's focused on Mary Anning and, and Lyme Regis, and we now have a statue to her on, on the uh, cliff top just overlooking the beach in Lyme Regis. And of course, when Mary Anning was going out collecting the fossils that made her famous, the area underneath church cliffs, particularly the area in the red box, that was being quarried actively. And they were uncovering huge bedding surfaces. And therefore, the quarrymen would contact Mary and she would come down and describe the fossils. Uh, so in a sense, she had a ready supply as they quarried onwards and they removed massive amounts of material. So there's all sorts of sagas about Mary Anning, uh, some of which are true, some of which are embellished, um, particularly the movie that came out. Um, but there are a couple of new books on her life and work, uh, and I certainly recommend those as being uh, more suitable to get a true picture of what she was doing and how she was supported by a whole range of scientists. One of them was William Buckland, um, born in Axminster and educated in Tiverton. Um, like many paleontologists in the 19th century, I mean, he was a minister, he became Dean of Westminster. And yet there he was at a time when religious beliefs and science were quite a bit in conflict. Um, there he was working on paleontology. Um, he described these peculiar objects, uh, coprolites, um, and there was a real um, set two between Buckland and one or two other paleontologists. And this led Henry de la Beche to um, rather take the rise out of Buckland's work. And of course, in his famous painting of ancient Dorset, de la Beche has all of these vertebrates um, with a trail of coprolites uh, coming from their nether regions. Um, and th this became a, a standing joke at the time. Now, one of the things that are in this photograph is a squid. Now, they don't normally hang in the water column quite like that. Uh, and there are fish. And of course, we know many of these cephalopod fossils, the the squid-like fossils, and we know many of the fish. So this was nothing unusual, but this is the first reconstruction or attempting a reconstruction of what the Jurassic Seas of Lyme Regis would have looked like, uh, and a fascinating insight into uh, paleontology. <coughs> Now, what happened was that when they were removing all these huge layers of rock under church cliffs, of course, what's happened now is that uh, this whole area began to slip into the sea. Um, if any of you used the car park up here um, in recent years, you will probably have noticed that there was a, a one meter cliff running across the middle of the car park where the thing was becoming detached from the mainland. And so the quarrying that Mary Anning benefited from uh, now led to a 21 million pound bill to put up Lyme Regis and stabilize that part of the coastline. But never mind, 
let's gloss over that. But the liest group sediments of Lyme Regis, Charmouth, and inland, they've yielded hundreds of specimens of ichthyosaurs, pliosaurs, plesiosaurs, in various states of completeness. Many other types of fossils, including the squid-like forms that I'm talking about. And of course, if you've ever visited uh, the area west of the Cobb, uh, you may have seen this beautiful ammonite pavement, which covers quite a large area on the foreshore uh, just before you get to Seven Rock Point. But within these rocks, we do find these squid-like cephalopods. And the top one there is one of the specimens that Mary Anning found, gave it to Buckman, and it's now in the natural, if you see the abbreviation NHMUK, um, that is Natural History Museum, United Kingdom. So it, it's just a code for where the specimens come from. And here you can see, <coughs> excuse me, part of this uh, skeleton-like structure, the equivalent of the cuttlefish bone, remember. Uh, you can see this ink sac that the animal would have uh, squirted out to confuse predators. And you can look at the ink sac under a scanning electron microscope. You can see the individual platelets of ink. Um, there has been a bit of an industry around Lyme Regis of people collecting ink sacs, grinding them up, and then making drawings using Jurassic ink, which I, I certainly don't condone because Usually it's the ink sac that you spot on a bedding plane first because it's black and stands out. Um, but this collection of material for drawing ink often leaves behind a lot of paleontological evidence, which is a very annoying. This specimen was broken. And when it was first put in the museum, it, the bits were joined up incorrectly. Um, they broke it again and reassembled it into its better shape. So here's the arms with the hooks, as you saw in that opening specimen. And just for comparison, here is uh, another specimen, which is like that one above, in the genus Clarkichufus. Well, this is named after Malcolm Clark, who I was uh, working with in the marine biological labs in Plymouth. And Malcolm Clark did a huge amount of work, which is why they've named a genus after him uh, and why his work is, is so uh, respected. But this specimen from Germany, Clarkichuthus conocorda, is again another specimen from the Natural History Museum. And we see the beautiful hooks here. Um, which is just a blow up of that area here. Now, there are some magnificent specimens of this German species. Um, and here's just a range of illustrations. For some reason, uh, and don't ask me how this would be preserved like this, you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight nine of the 10 arms beautifully splayed out. Well, if you try and think how you would preserve that on a bedding surface uh, in, a, in a pile of rock, it, it's really quite difficult. But one of the characteristic things of this individual is you notice the hooks are all in pairs. You also notice they've got a particularly characteristic appearance with a hooked end and an inflated uh, bottom end here. And this inflated structure is really quite characteristic because when you look at another specimen from um, Clarkichuthus, which was again 
collected at Lyme Regis uh, and is in the Manchester Museum. You can see this inflated base, uh, a sort of a, a structure like that. And all of these hooks have that characteristic appearance. Apart from the fact that the pairs here are not identical pairs, as was the case in that German specimen. It's rather funny that when I first tried to track this specimen down in Manchester Museum, I looked up the code number I had, and it turned out to be a fossil pig. Um, they'd got their numbers mixed up, but we've sorted that out. It's, it's available in Manchester Museum with a correct number now. And when you look at any other specimens, and this is another one from Charmouth, you can see the paired hooks. Um, along here's a little hook and here's a slightly bigger hook. And, and this is interesting to me that this rock is highly biotubated and yet the hooks are all apparently in position. I, I don't understand that. But in this particular case, unlike the one I showed earlier, uh, the arms here have become totally mixed up. Well, Let's jump to another paleontologist who was working at this time. And Richard Owen, who basically founded the Natural History Museum in London, um, and who was an arch opponent of uh, Charles Darwin's evolutionary theories. Um, and in fact, Darwin and him really didn't get on. Um, but in the Oxford clay, uh, Owen described some of these squid-like fossils. But then when the Great Western Railway was being built, and here's Swindon, and it comes down here, that's the railway line, they had to build a railway embankment and they dug Oxford clay out of the ground to build up the embankment. And they found a large number of these particular fossils. And so the British Geological Survey decided to re-excavate the site. Um, and what they did was uh, they dug a huge hole to find these uh, fossils in the Oxford clay, which is the equivalent of the levels on the Jurassic coast that Owen had described. But what happened was they forgot that there were Pleistocene gravels on top of the Oxford clay and the, the hole filled up with water. And we were faced with uh, simple piles of Oxford clay. Well, the paleo some of the paleontologists were scrabbling around in here, but of course to a micro paleontologist, we can't use isolated piles like that. Um, so in comes a drilling rig, uh, drilled 10 holes, uh, some of them very luckily collected ammonites beautifully right in the middle of the core barrel there. And so we can date these rocks in terms of the ammonite stratigraphy. But what we uh, did was look at the clay sediments that were surrounding these magnificent fossils. And these are the ones again from the Natural History Museum. Yeah. And you can see the lines of hooks along the various arms, and you can see them almost in situ here in that specimen that you saw earlier. Other specimens of the same species are in Bristol Museum and are really worth a visit. You can see these hooks uh, rather tapered, but these don't have inflated bases with a sort of bilobate structure. They're completely different. So is it possible to identify these squid-like cephalopods by their hooks? And the answer is, well, up to a point, yes. But this specimen here um, really is controversial because <laughs> if you look at the arms, you can see a line of suckers. But in the middle of those suckers are hooks. 
Now, when I've watched an octopus climbing up the side of a glass tank in the uh, marine aquarium in Plymouth, I can't understand how a sucker works if it's got a hook in the middle of it. But paleontologists are arguing absolutely about what this specimen actually means. Um, I just keep to one side because I'm only just interested in the hooks and not how they were used within the sucker. But in these samples that we got from these borehole cores, uh, we found literally tens of thousands of microfossils. Here are some foraminifera, uh, absolutely beautiful, classic oxford clay material. Um, we know all about these species. Uh, some of them live attached to shell fragments. So they're interesting. But, and here is one of the cores, and <clears throat> here is the squid bed where all the people found the beautifully preserved fossils you've just seen. But within these sediments, when we washed them to get the foraminifera out, we found thousands of peculiar bone-like structures. Well, they're not bone, they're aragonite, form of calcite. And these are statoliths. They're the balancing organs of these squid-like cephalopods. Just as fish have balancing organs in their head, uh, we call them otoliths. These fossil squid-like forms have these uh, statoliths. And specimen A and B, <clears throat> which is the right and left side, comes from Christian Malford. So does E and F. C and D comes from Lyme Regis, and uh, G there comes from uh, Abbotsbury on the Dorset coast. But you can see when you count through these things, how many there are within the sediment. Malcolm Clark was absolutely um, amazed, slightly horrified how many we were finding. Um, and the interesting thing is he'd been provided with some specimens by amateur fossil collectors um, and all of them were broken. And that was simply due to the way they were preparing the material. As you can see, none of ours are broken. Uh, we do things very gently, I'm afraid, in micropaleontology. Now, here's a modern spirula, and you can see the two statoliths. They're not eyes. These are in an X-ray photograph, so they're solid. Uh, and that's the equivalent within the Christian Malford section. So we know that modern spirula still has statoliths. And so we can look at all these. We've been gathering them uh, around Europe. This specimen is very strange that it almost seems to have blood vessels impregnated on the surface. I think that's what they are. I have no way of proving it. Um, it's just that whenever you collect specimens like this, you get more questions than answers. So are they blood vessels? Well, I hope so. And what we've been able to do is to piece together these statoliths and, and see how they're distributed within the rocks of the Dorset coast. and. We're gradually building up a picture as to uh, their distribution. But the other thing we find are the hooks. Now you've seen hooks like this. Uh, you've also seen the ones that are the uh, inflated bases. And here at the bottom are some uh, what we call mega hooks. Uh, these are a lot larger. Uh, and rather simple structures. Now, many of these hooks are found in a whole host of different ways. Um, 
a pair of Polish geologists dissolved them out of limestone, which of course destroyed every relationship between them um, and really was a bit unsatisfactory, but never mind, uh, that's how they did it. What we've done is look at the hooks in our specimens, in the specimens in museums, and done an analysis of just what range of form there is. So we're looking at the mode of life, how these animals uh, collected and found their prey, how they grasped it, how they ate them. And we're still trying to understand the distribution of all these different types. Because the question is, are they distinctive of one species? Do they vary along the arms? Uh, do they change shape during evolution? In other words, uh, do they actually uh, confuse paleontologists uh, by changing through time? What we can do is we can ask these questions, <clears throat> but of course, when they're a residue processed from a clay, we do lose some of the um, evidence. But I think the middle one's important. Do the hooks present in any particular species remain constant during the stratigraphic range of a taxon? And so th that is important because it governs our use of them in time. Now we can find them in a number of ways, uh, process residues or acid reductions. We can find them in beautifully preserved material, so-called Lagerstatter. We can find them in stomach contents of vertebrates. And we can see regurgitated masses of completely disorganized piles of hooks. Here's a specimen of an ichthyosaur, which is in the Etches collection in Dorset. And you can see a hook sitting there. Well, this is where the stomach would be, um, but it could also have meant it, it washed in on top of the specimen. So getting stomach contents is not a 100% a proven case. I should say that this is a patch of ichthyosaur skin, uh, which is in this specimen. And some people might find that more interesting. In some museums, um, it's interesting what you can find. In, in Leeds City Museum, they had two specimens, um, but when you laid them out on a bench, you actually found that they were the same specimen and you could join them back together again. And there again, you can see all the arms scattered on the bedding surface uh, in this area here disconnected from uh, the body and the ink sac that will be there. This is a specimen from near Lyme Regis and fossil collector um, Chris Moore has prepared it. And you can see, uh, well, with a bit of poetic license, which some paleontologists would frown at, um, He's actually excavated the specimen, to my mind, really quite beautifully to show potentially what the arms with the hooks look like. As I say, some paleontological purists um, find that to be tampering with the science, um, but I personally would find it actually quite useful. The other thing when I was looking at <clears throat> this particular specimen was that I found this specimen in Lyme Regis Museum. Now it was on loan from the Geological Survey Museum, hence the GSM number. Now what this is, here's the, the ink sack. Here's probably the jaw. 
And here is a fossil fish. And when you look at the fossil fish, you can see the scales, you can see the bones in the head, and you can see along this side and that side, the hooks that imply, and I have to choose words carefully, implies that this uh, squid-like cephalopod was eating the fish. It had caught the fish. That's assuming you believe this is all part of one specimen, because there is a gap there um, with nothing preserved. But, you know, that's, that's the random nature of preservation. The fish is identified as Dorsodictes becchii, named after Henry de la Beche. But the question is, are we looking at actual life in the Jurassic Sea? Was this squid-like cephalopod swimming around, catching fish, possibly eating the fish? Or is this just a freak bit of preservation of two fossils superimposed? Well, <clears throat> here's a cartoon of a specimen, again from uh, Germany, where you have the arms of this particular squid catching a fish. And in this particular case, the, the fish seems to have been bitten across the body between the head and, and the main part of the body. And Christian Klug, uh, drew this uh, or painted this. He, he's a very gifted paleontologist uh, and he produced this lifelike painting. But of course, when we look at this one, um, it's not grasping the fish in the same way. In this particular case, you can see that it, it's really stopping the fish getting away by being caught in the middle section, whereas in the Dorset specimen, the Lyme Regis specimen, it's definitely a head-on version. So I got in touch with an expert on this particular fish species who's based in the University of Kansas, and Gloria had a good look at it. She identified all the bones of the head. Um, she identified the fact that these bones had not been crushed by burial. They'd actually been bitten through or broken through. There were sharp edges, jagged edges, uh, and therefore it looked like a pretty violent attack by uh, the squid. And so when we look at this, uh, it's doubtful whether the squid is big enough to cope with eating this fish, but it's certainly bit chunks out of the head region, while it seems to be holding the specimen with its arms down each side. So we can play games as paleontologists. We can think of how uh, life was behaving, what fossils were doing to feed, uh, how they were buried and preserved. But then you think that this particular fossil, the squid and the fish, both died, both settled to the seafloor, were buried without being eaten by something else, and are preserved in the geological record. A whole host of really quite unique circumstances. Here's another fish, again from a Natural History Museum specimen. Uh, here you can see the body of the fish, uh, the tail fins. So in this particular case, the fish seems to have been attacked in the middle um, as the painting by Christian Klug showed in his specimen. So catching fish seems to have been um, an everyday occurrence and more and more specimens are coming to light uh, showing this activity. When we look at these statoliths, um, we can look at them under X-ray. We can actually see growth rings. 
we can look and work out the age of specimens using the growth rings. Uh, and remember, these are 160 million years old, and yet we're calculating that these are potentially daily growth rings, a day in the life of the Jurassic, uh, very strange. And Ark Hipkin, in a paper in 2005, uh, described these statoliths as black boxes, the analogy to modern planes with a black box recording what was going on. And so by looking at their internal structure, we can uh, determine a bit more about their life history. So it's great fun looking at specimens in museums, but then a new fossil comes out the ground. Um, this is a nodule. It's a different species and genus. It's Lolygosepia bucklandi. Um, and you can see it's got a calcareous uh, structure, which might have been appetite when it was first formed. And here's the bit that would have fitted on top of that. Uh, broken open from the nodule. And then within the head area, uh, we can see the hooks and jaws of the specimen. Of course, you can say, well, this is the first evidence of that type of jaw structure in the lower Jurassic. Uh, it's always tempting to say this is the first example of and doing that's a sure sign that somebody will come along a week later and find yet again another earlier specimen. So um, we'll be cautious on that. But this is a beautiful specimen. Um, and it's uh, just being recently cleaned. And we're busy, or we have uh, described it as best we can. There you can see the scale and a 20p coin just for, for scale. When we looked in the museum collections, uh, this was in the National Museum of Wales, a specimen very comparable um, to that. You can see the structure here. And there's the structure on this Welsh, uh, well, not Welsh specimen, it came from Lyme Regis, but it's in the National Museum Wales. Here's another one. And in the Natural History Museum in London, uh, there's further specimens. Many of these lack real stratigraphic information, but putting it all together, we can show the range of this particular uh, species to be within that part of the Lias succession on the Dorset coast. And we do know that there is a statolith from this interval, but that is just a geological coincidence. Um, if we found that specimen in the head area, um, and we've actually put that specimen through a CT scan to see if we can find it, uh, we didn't. Um, but until you can prove that that occurs in here, uh, you don't know that the two are related. It might be tempted to say it has the same stratigraphic range, might be tempted to say it occurs in the same rocks, uh, but you cannot be definitive on it. I've got to go. But the problem for us is that on the Dorset coast, there is a fossil collecting code um, and we don't know exactly where this specimen came from, so it cannot therefore be donated to a museum. It cannot therefore be published in the scientific literature because nobody has access to the specimen. And a fossil collector, now I know this won't happen, but Potentially, it could be sold on eBay to anybody anywhere in the world, and the specimen would disappear. So we'd never be able to look at it again and check the paleontology. And so this, this is a little bit of a problem that we're faced with at the moment. 
but um, it doesn't dis doesn't stop us describing it, uh, communicating like I'm doing now that we actually have this specimen. I know exactly where it is. I know where the owner has it. Um, and hopefully one day we will be able to get a museum collection where it can be put and we can then describe it properly in the literature. At the moment, we can communicate it like this, but we cannot um, officially describe it, which might seem rather bizarre, but there are rules of international nomenclature and regulations. Um, and as a paleontologist, I obviously have to stick to those rules. Well, I've mentioned people like Buckland, Delabesh, Owen, and Mary Anning for that matter. Um, what I hope is that these really quite great figures in the past um, would be supportive of where the science of paleontology has moved, um, what we're doing, how we're using all sorts of techniques, uh, CT scans, um, analysis of various forms, x-rays to look at the statilis and daily growth rings. I think they'd be surprised. I certainly think that Delabesh and, and Richard Owen um, would love to have been around now to see just what we're doing with their paleontological information. Um, so what I've tried to communicate to this morning is just how beautiful some of these fossils are, how we look at them, what sort of things we're looking for, uh, and how it's allowing us to build up a record uh, all along that Jurassic coast and actually confirm the UNESCO mission that it does have universal value uh, to the science and other communities. So anyway, um, thank you for listening to that.